Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on new tools to strengthen VMMC demand creation. My name is Lee Hebler and I am an Events and Outreach Manager at JSI. Before we begin today's presentations, I'd like to quickly review the Adobe Connect environment and set a few norms for today's webinar. Today's webinar has two presentations, followed by a discussion period during which our speakers will address your questions. Within the webinar environment, please make sure, sorry, please make use of the Q&A box on the bottom right, right side of your screen to share your thoughts, note your questions, or ask for help with sound during our presentation. Questions you ask are only visible to you, our presenters, and technical support. If you are experiencing difficulties, our technical support will respond to your question privately. We will collect your questions for our speakers and will save them for the discussion period. It is great that we are able to connect people from so many places today, but your experience may vary based on your internet connection and computer equipment. I will briefly go over a few troubleshooting steps if you have technology challenges today. A few troubleshooting tips. If you lose connectivity or cannot hear, please close the webinar. Re-enter the meeting room in a browser other than Google Chrome by clicking on the webinar link provided. Use the Q&A box to ask aid free tech for assistance. If the troubleshooting steps are not successful, please rest assured the webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording following today's event. The recording will also be posted on the AIDS Free website. Questions that do not get answered during the Q&A sessions will be compiled after the webinar, shared with the presenters, and responses from presenters will be shared with participants and others via the AIDS Free website. To get us started, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Erin Brookhaven. Thank you so much, Lee. First, I'd like to welcome and thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Erin Brookhaven. I'm the Knowledge Management Director for the AIDS3 Project and JSI. For today's webinar, organized by AIDS3, uh, we will introduce two new tools to strengthen demand creation for VMMC. First, AIDS3 and JSI Senior Technical Advisor for Social and Behavior Change, Liz Gold, she will walk us through a new training curriculum entitled Creating Demand for VMMC, a training for community mobilizers. Then USAID Senior Behavior Change Advisor Maria Carrasco will share a new tool for assessing the quality of your program's demand creation. Please be sure to add your questions in the Q&A box for our discussion period, and please everyone silent your phones and devices. Um, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Liz Gold. Um, who is the AIDS3 Senior Technical Advisor for Social and Behavior Change. Uh, Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I know it, it's early for some and late for others. Okay. So this morning I'm going to tell you a bit about um, – hold on one second. Let me make sure I can – Okay, great. This morning I want to tell you a bit about why we decided to, to develop this curriculum, who it's intended for, how it's structured, some of the training methods that are used in this, and how you might adopt this for your own local context. So first, why did we decide to develop this curriculum? I mean, everyone has their own training curriculum, right? But given the critical role of community mobilizers in generating demand, we decided to just take a closer look at how our AIDS free country programs were training their mobilizers. And for, for those who don't know, those countries are Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, and Namibia. Well, as, as you see here, a small survey showed each country was kind of doing their own thing when it came to training. Um, in addition, discussions with mobilizers showed the content that was included in their training really varied widely. When I asked some of our demand creation leads, how would you rate the quality of the training curriculum that you're using now, no one really gave themselves very high marks. So we decided in the end there's a need to standardize the training for higher quality and better results, but still allowing for adapting to local context. So who can use this curriculum? Um, the curriculum is designed to be used by ministries of health and VMMC implementing partners 
when training their mobilizers or volunteer community advocates, sometimes referred to as recruiters or ITC agents. Um, the objective, the aim is to train participants to increase their knowledge of the MMC for HIV prevention, to become familiar with communication strategies, tools, improve their interpersonal communication skills, and gain the confidence to promote the MMC in their communities and effectively mobilize men for services. So we went back and forth about should this be a two-day training, a four-day training? But after some discussion with field staff in the effort to balance all of the content that needs to be covered, but with the practical reality of your time and budget constraints, we decided on a three-day training. The first two days are spent in the classroom, with a third day for a site visit to a VMMC clinic and observation of a mobilization activity. The curriculum consists of the trainer's manual, plus there's a slide deck that goes with the manual, a very, very large slide deck. Uh, because the training's designed to be highly interactive and hands-on, it's really best to have a smaller group, no more than 20 participants in one workshop if you can do it, because otherwise it just won't be as effective of a training. On day one, as you see here, uh, it's focused on the clinical aspects. What is the MMC, the benefits and limitations, its role in combination prevention, and what happens the day of the procedure, walking through the process, what a client would go through before, during, and after. Day one should be facilitated by a clinical director or a very experienced provider. There's also a brief overview that day of the country's national VMMC program that can be presented by the ministry. There are small group discussions and games, so it's not just death by PowerPoint. Then day two gets a bit more fun. Participants learn about strategies for creating demand for VMMC. They gain an understanding of the key barriers and the motivators that can either hinder or facilitate men's uptake of VMMC. And they have a chance to role play a mobilizer and a potential client interaction. On that day, they work on effective communication techniques, practicing those in pairs, and learn about planning and executing mobilization activities. And then day three starts with a site visit to the MMC site. There, the participants meet the site staff. They get to see the, the client flow. And they see for themselves what they learned about in the classroom on day one. This is then followed by the observation of a mobilization activity. And that can be sort of any type of mobilization activity, but ideally some located somewhat convenient to, to where your training venue is, so you don't have to waste too much time for travel that day. Participants have a series of questions that they're answering about what they're observing related to what they learned the day before in the classroom. Then after the site visit, they return to the classroom for the final quiz and wrap up of the training. As far as training methods, there's a variety of methods that are used uh, depending on what the learning objectives of a particular session are, such as role play, small group discussions, games, and a mock mobilization session. A satisfied client is invited to participate throughout the three days and shares his experience as different topics come up in discussion. So, for example, if the topic is uh, motiv barriers, motivators, he might share what his personal motivation was for, for going for circumcision. Um, in this photo, you see a, a satisfied client sharing his experience of managing pain. This was a couple weeks ago in a, a training in Eswatini. Um, the presenter was talking about the procedure and pain management, and then the satisfied client shared his experience and took questions from the participants. I think his participation was kind of a highlight for, for the participants. So at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, this is all really nice, but how am I going to use this generic curriculum in my local context? So we actually thought a lot about that, and there are several areas that can be easily adapted to better fit your context. 
So for example, the overview of the country's program, that section has placeholder slides in the slide deck where you can customize for your country targets, et cetera. For the session on common myths, you probably want to add a few of your own local myths if you don't find them here in this curriculum. You might even want to switch out some of the photos in the slides for more local photos. And in some cases, you'll probably need to translate into local language. So one question you might have is, what do we do with our current curriculum that we're using right now? So while we're recommending that you use this because it is so comprehensive, you could consider adding modules or information from your current curriculum that you're fine missing from this one. Or alternatively, if, if you already have a curriculum that's working well for you, fine, then you could cross-check it with this curriculum and then add any missing sessions to yours. It's totally up to you, of course. So quickly, just, just a few examples, um, I'll go through very quickly to show you some of the from some of the slide decks. So this is just from a session on, on day two where the participants are being introduced to the various strategic approaches that can be used to create demand and which one is suited for which particular objective. Here's another example um, where it's being explained to participants that going through the MMC is a complex decision-making process that may happen for some over a long period of time with different channels reaching the man at different stages of his journey. And in this session here, um, participants are learning various communication techniques that help to create a supportive environment and meet the individual's needs. Uh, there's also a role play exercise where they practice the skill of active listening. So that's about all I'm going to say for now, because I'm, I'm actually hoping that I got your interest enough that you're going to take a look at the curriculum for yourself. At the end of Maria's presentation, you're going to find the link where you can access the training manual and the slide deck. But I just want to thank and acknowledge the contributions of all the people that I've listed here. But in particular, I want to call out Mayende and Maria Tanke, the demand creation gurus out there, because in developing this curriculum, I really drew heavily on the training that they are doing in Tanzania and Mozambique. I was constantly bugging them and bouncing ideas around with them. So I really want to show my appreciation to them. OK, back to you, Erin. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, that was a real excellent in, uh, presentation and overview. It sounds like and looks like this curriculum is very comprehensive. Um, and it's going to be a really useful tool. Um, just as a reminder to all of our participants, please add your questions for Liz in the Q&A box um, for our discussion. Uh, and our next presentation is from Maria Carrasco from USAID. She's the Senior Behavior Change Advisor. Um, she will be discussing a new tool for assessing the quality of your program's demand creation. Uh, so Maria, I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all. Uh, I am actually very uh, happy to have the opportunity to share this tool with you. It's been a, a long time in the making, and it's great to finally have it ready and to, and to share it uh, with you all for, for use. So uh, if you have wanted to assess your VMMC demand creation efforts and at some point have trouble uh, knowing where to start or how to, ma how to maximize your time, um, or how to go about it in general, you know, where to go, what's, what uh, aspect of BMMC the migration to assess, well, this is the tool for you. So I'm, I'm happy that, that you are here with us um, to, to, to know a little bit about this tool. So uh, in my presentation, I will give you, um, okay, I'll give you a brief background on the tool development and also details on how to use the tool. Uh, tool structure and content, and final suggestions on how to report results. So a little bit of the background. The purpose of the assessment tool is to identify strengths, gaps, challenges, and areas in need of improvement in your VMMT demand creation work. 
The tool was developed by H3 in collaboration with USAID technical staff, and it is based on experience conducting VMMC demand creation assessments in various countries over the five years, or even maybe a little bit longer. So as you can see, we've really put into this tool all the experience from, from various assessments. We pilot tested the tool in Malawi and South Africa, and in advance, thanks to the teams in both, those, both of those countries for, for their help with this. And then uh, the tool is meant to be used by USAID, VMMC points of contact, VMMC coordinators at the Ministry of Health, and also VMMC implementing partners in the field. Okay, so in terms of uh, what the tool entails, the tool has four parts. Part one is an interview with, project demand with the project demand creation lead. Part two is an, a fixed uh, site observation. Part three is a discussion guide for community mobilizers. And uh, part four is the observation of a mobilization activity. Parts uh, one and two uh, are actually a rapid assessment that could be used by people involved in VMMC or prevention programming in general. And then part three and four, if added to part one and two, provide a longer and more in-depth view of VMMC demand creation efforts. And part three and four could be used, again, by um, folks involved in VMMC in general, but we recommend that uh, people that have a specialized knowledge of behavioral sciences or are experts in VMMC demand creation uh, are the ones uh, using those tools, those two tools. So uh, for parts one, uh, for parts one, two, and four, the questions point to what an evaluator would hope to see in place to ensure strong VMMC demand creation. So um, and also just you know, I haven't showed you the part, the different parts yet, but each part has a series of questions that uh, that can be answered in different uh, segments of time. So um, again, for parts one, two, and four, the questions are general information that you would hope to see or general activities that you hope to see. In the tools, uh, you can, uh, for this part, there's a column to answer yes, no, don't know, and then also comment, a column for comment. So for the questions that have no answers and, and don't know, it's always important to know uh, what are the comments, to have more information for when uh, you are writing the report. For part three, the questions help to assess the work with community mobilizers. And uh, the mix of demand creation strategies implemented will be different in different countries and in different locations and at different times. So because of this, uh, we were not uh, able to come up with a numeric score. We thought about that quite a bit, actually, but then we realized it doesn't make sense to, to have a numeric score because of these uh, variation and, if you will, hetero heterogeneity among the different, uh, the different countries and, again, even within a country. So the tool, in this sense, is really more of a, of a of, um, tool to uh, promote conversation and to look in, in depth in term, in, into what's happening in your demand creation efforts. The tool helps to take a snapshot of demand creation efforts and identified strategies that could be added. And uh, the questions in the tool, like I said, are meant to facilitate conversation. And note that a few questions may have to be adapted to fit your local context. And in the next, in the future slides, in the slides following, I'll show you what I, an example of this. And uh, but you know, don't be concerned about this. The adaptations will have to be minor. So um, the tool can still be useful in uh, various uh, VMMC priority countries. Okay, so with all that information or background, let's take a, a look um, at the tool. So here is a, a snapshot of uh, part one, which is the interview with the demand creation point of contact. This part includes 45 questions that gives an overview of the demand creation efforts in a specific geographic area. The different questions are subdivided in, in subsections, and uh, there are six subsections, one on community mobilization, a second one on structural service level factors, a third one on planning and coordination, a section on overcoming seasonality, uh, a fifth section on media, 
and finally a section on referral and linkages. And to prepare um, for this, to assess this part, you should set up an appointment of about one hour to 1.5 hours with the VMMC demand creation lead. And you can see some of the questions in the slide. Um, there are some examples here. So for example, one of the questions is, do you have a dedicated community mobilizer for each side? And are you recruiting satisfied clients as mobilizers? And so on and so forth. Again, as mentioned in, uh, previously, you know, you see here the columns, yes, no, don't know, and comments. Whenever you know, uh, know or don't know, please make sure to include comments to understand, you know, where that no or don't know is coming from. Because it, if there's a no, it doesn't mean that something is missing. There could be a perfectly reasonable answer for why that particular strategy was not implemented in that particular context. Again, the questions are meant to be a guide for conversation. And something to note is that some new questions may pop up when you are going through the tool. And if that is the case, it's important to write them down so that you can also include that information when you do uh, your report. OK, very good. So on to part two. Part two is a um, site observation. Uh, part two includes 15 questions, and to implement this part, uh, you set up a site visit to a VMMC site. And uh, in this slide, you can also see some sample questions. So for example, do you find five or more clients at the site? And uh, again, if you find that the answer is no, there may be a reasonable explanation. Another question uh, here in the slide uh, in this tool is that uh, are the majority of clients you find there uh, of the age group of 15 years and above? And I am um, highlighting this question because this is one of the questions that you may need to contextualize for your country or for the geographic area. So for example, in uh, at least two countries in Lesotho and Tanzania, the priority age group starts at 10. So you know, you'll just uh, do a minor change to this question and look to make sure that, that the clients are 10 years and above. So uh, one thing to note about tools one and two is, uh, again, the don't know column. Um, in some cases, the demand creation lead may not know the answer. And that is OK. But it's important always to have a conversation and a discussion uh, of you know, what, what's the situation. Great. So the next slide. So uh, part three is a discussion with community mobilizers. And part three is meant to assess whether mobilizers are well managed, resourced, mentored, trained, and supported to ensure a strong demand creation effort. And this part is very important because, as Liz mentioned, mobilizers are essential to having a strong VMMC demand creation. In fact, data shows that most clients accessing VMMC are coming because of their efforts. So part three includes 24 questions to facilitate a rich conversation. And to prepare uh, for this part, you should invite five to eight mobilizers for a group discussion of about one hour, uh, maybe one hour and 30 minutes at the most. And uh, for some of you, like in the case of Lisa and me, when we've, we've done this, um, you have to make sure to get a translator in advance. And then on to the next section, part three, I mean, part four uh, entails the observation of community mobilization act of the community mobilization activity, and this could be implemented at a school, at a workplace, at taxi runs, bus stops, soccer match, and so on and so forth. In this section, in this part, there are eleven questions to gauge the quality of community mobilization activities, and to prepare for this uh, part, you should set up a field observation of the community mobilization activity. And of course, uh, the choice is up to you in terms of what you, you would prefer to observe. And uh, finally, um, in terms of uh, the report, uh, we actually, in the tool, we provide a template that you can use for reporting. But you should also feel free to use uh, a, report, a template that you already have or um, a structure the report as you think is best for your country or your context. And uh, we recommend developing a report after using the tool because this helps to just digest the information that you have collected with the tool. 
And uh, we also recommend that you summarize the information and include uh, uh, observations in at least uh, these uh, six areas that are noted in the slide. So for community mobilization, this will be your work with community mobilizers. For structural and server service level factors, um, this uh, includes um, information about transportation, hours of operation, access for clients, and so on and so forth. Uh, planning and coordination includes uh, whether the service delivery team is coordinating with the demand creation team, and also if uh, currently the program is using a site optimization tool or some other tool to ensure that the site you use is optimized so you don't have staff sitting idle. Um, then the section on media includes an assessment on uh, printed media and mass media. Data collection and analysis is a section on what data is being collected to inform the mine creation effort and making sure the data is enough or noting if more data is needed. And the last uh, part is the uh, part on referral and linkages uh, to look into whether the referrals to VMMC are being conducted from other uh, HIV service platforms, particularly from HIV testing. And then I think that's all I have in terms of an overview of the tool. I would like to acknowledge Liz Gold, of course, who is the main author of the tool, and also uh, Valerian Kigundu and Anuk Ramsel, who provided leadership and support from USAID. And also many, many thanks to the teams, the A3 team in Malawi and the URC team in South Africa, who helped us to pilot test the tool. The disclaimer, and then finally, here is the link where you can actually download the tools and adapt them, contextualize them, and use them in your programs to enhance your demand creation efforts. So with that, I conclude my presentation, and over to you, Erin. Great. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and overview um, of this new tool. Um, I wanted to remind uh, participants to please continue to add your questions for Liz and Maria in the Q&A box for our discussion. Um, uh, and thanks again to both of our speakers um, for their presentations. We'll now use the rest of the time um, for discussion. Uh, and the good news is we have plenty of time. And thanks, Liz and Maria, for keeping to your time, um, which you know we have uh, about 30 minutes left for discussion. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions um, that we can. And any uh, questions that won't be answered, uh, that if we run out of time to answer today, they'll be collected. And we will ask the speakers to share their responses and then post them on the AIDS 3 website uh, following the webinar. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, as we get started, um, let's see. Uh, I have, uh, our first question is, um, uh, and this one is for Liz. And so far as how often um, you do trainings as part of and use this curriculum, um, how often would you give this training? And you, can you talk a little bit about a refresher training or how often um, should this training occur? Thanks, Erin. Uh, sorry, well, I just noticed people are asking you to put the link slide back up again with the training link. Yeah, OK. okay. How often? That's actually a really good question. I, I don't know if I'm even the best person to answer that because I think people that have more experience with actually doing the training might. I would think every six months is probably. I, I know there's a high turnover often of of the mobilizers, right? So, but but one thing I I, I think would be tricky would be to combine people at various levels in one training. So I wouldn't I wouldn't advise doing new trainees with refreshers together because I think that that would be tough. You would rather have people that are at the same experience level in one training. But others may may have a better response to that. I don't know, Maria, do you have a thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that, that's actually a great question. Well, when we developed these or, you know, the, the idea behind the training was really the training that Liz presented was um, providing a comprehensive, um, you know, initial training for mobilizers. So, you know, that's important to know. This is your initial comprehensive training with everything, hopefully, with most things or everything a mobilizer should know. 
And for example, one thing to highlight is, you know, the mobilizer knowing what's happening during the VMMC service. We've seen that, that that's a gap, and we've added it, um, that information in the training. Another thing, for example, is ethical considerations. In some countries, we've seen that's a gap, so we've added that. So with that said, you know, in terms of uh, what, when should a refresher be done and what should be the content? Well, you know, since in the initial training you've already covered the basic ground, one thing to consider for refreshers is, of course, focusing more on actual mobilization skills. So, for example, you know, the um, uh, communication, you know, different communication skills and also how to reach uh, potential clients and follow up with potential clients. Now, we per se have not developed a refresher training. Maybe that's something leaves uh, an idea to consider and look into for, for you know, next steps. But uh, those are some thoughts in terms of what you would want to do for refresher training. Uh, maybe others want to add, um, other colleagues from the field that have joined. Yeah, are they able to speak, Erin? Uh, no, uh, un unfortunately, no. Um, yeah, their audio is all muted, but they can certainly respond um, or type additional questions into the yeah. Q&A box. For sure. So um, maybe we could move on to the next question. Um, and, uh, and this is for Liz. Um, so a community mobilizer can be, but isn't necessary, necessarily a VMMC client. Um, can you talk about the various motivations of the people who become mo mobilizers? Oh, that's an interesting question. So you're saying what is their, you're asking what is their motivation for becoming a mobilizer? Is that yes. the question? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. So right, I mean it, it is our goal to get as many satisfied clients as, as possible among our, not, as you said, not all have to be, but a good percentage should be because we find that they they are definitely very effective as mobilizers because the, the men really can relate to them and, and trust them and feel like their concerns are being addressed by somebody who's been through the experience. Um, as far as their motivation, I think um, it depends. I've, I've talked to some that really want to share this thing with their peers. They're excited about it. They want their peers to know about it. Um, they may get some sort of positive reinforcement from their community. There can be um, incentives. Not, I wouldn't use the word incentives. It's probably not a good word. Um, we probably would like to stay away from that word. But there um, certainly is some remuneration for it. But um, I don't know. I don't know if others have other motivations. I've seen them sort of feel kind of a um, being a role model among the, the men in their community, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add to that uh, also contributing to the health of their community and having a sense of, uh, you know, that, that they're contributing to, to improving yeah. their community. I've heard that from, from mobilizers before. So, but, I mean, one thing to definitely, you know, put out there is that there is that incentive in terms of, you know, having some kind of income or some kind of supplement to their income. That that's always helpful, um, especially in some of the communities where we work. You know, where there there are not a lot of uh, job opportunities, uh, it may actually be an import, a very important consideration for folks. On the flip Thank side you. of that, I think it can be very demotivating if if they don't if they aren't given the tools to do their job. We've seen that also where they they feel very demotivated and they quit because they. You know, they're not given proper uniforms or ID badges or compensated on time. Those kinds of things can demotivate. So I think when we do the opposite and we really give them the tools to do it, they, they are much more motivated. We've seen that as well. Yeah, and just really quickly, to quickly add to that, a good, strong training is actually a good motivator uh, because then folks feel that they, mobilizers feel that they are, uh, you know, able and ready to mobilize uh, the community. So I've, I've heard that uh, from some mobilizers too. And then also, and you know, going back to refreshers, the need for refreshers, uh, because things always come up. 
So it's always good to bring uh, mobilizers back to discuss skills and things that have come up during their, during their, uh, their mobilization activities. And Maria and Liz, could you talk a little bit about the recruitment and the role of a volunteer community advocate versus a community mobilizer, uh, you know, besides the volunteer part of sort of their title or role? Um, is it hard to recruit community advocates? What's the approach of doing that? Um, and sort of what the difference, the separation or the difference in role between a community mobilizer and a volunteer community advocate? I think our Tanzania program is probably the best example of the, the volunteer community advocates, right, Maria? I mean, they've had very good experiences. Yeah. With, yeah. They're probably the best example of, of where it's, it's worked well. Yeah, I would say, I mean, in general, you know, and, and um, I, it's too bad my auntie cannot, cannot uh, come in and, and speak to about it um, because in Tanzania is where they primarily work with uh, community advocates. I mean, in general, you know, this word or this label that we use, community mobilization, community, mobili uh, community mobilizers, takes different shapes in different countries. So in some countries, is you know, community volunteer advocate. In some other countries, is um, uh, you know, some. So anyway, there are different titles that mobilizers use, and uh, and that depends on the context and what you know, folks in in the field feel is more appropriate. And it's also you know, the title is also a motivator. So, um, you know, what is going to be the more motivating title to, to give uh, and to, uh, to, to the people who are actually mobilizing um, potential clients and bringing, in, bringing them into the service? So in terms of the differences, I mean, to really respond to that question, we would almost have to, you know, take these role in the different countries and see how they vary. But the, the factors where they vary are sometimes in terms of, you know, compensation. In some countries, um, the, the mobilizers or advocates, you know, are part-time. Some countries actually have some full-time folks. But I think it's primarily part-time, I should say. Um, in terms of how they, they are supervised and managed, also what resources they get. So there, there are variations like that. But I should say in general for the training that we have developed, it should apply or that, that we are sharing, it should apply for uh, mobilizers, community advocates, and uh, people on the ground that are, you know, helping you to mobilize potential clients and bring them on to VMNC services. So Mayende has just written in the box um, uh, regarding the last question about refreshers that in Tanzania they've used biweekly, monthly supportive supervision and field coaching to address areas of additional capacity and new knowledge. So rather than where you might have used a refresher, it's been effective in closing that gap that a refresher may traditionally be used to address. So a low-dose, high-frequency approach may be a good substitute for refreshers. That's really interesting. Thanks, Mande, for that. Great. Thanks. Well, let's move on to the next question. Um, so there's some evidence that women can be just as effective as men in the role of the community mobilizer. Has that been your experience? Um, and is it more of a local question insofar as the role of women? Definitely women can. can oh, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, they can be. I, um, from what I've seen, I think it kind of depends on, on the audience or the age group or, you know, um, the women seem to do very well with the younger ones, for example, whereas uh, the men or the satisfied client could be more effective when you're talking to someone, you know, 20 and above. It's not to say that they're not, they are effective for sure. Um, I think it kind of depends on who they're talking to in the context. What do you think, Maria? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, it depends. And, you know, one, some, some countries, what they've done is they set different cadres of mobilizers to reach different audiences. So in a particular country, it may be that women are more successful mobilizing youth, for example. Uh, in a country, it may be that, you know, you actually want to satisfy client to mobilize other clients. And on that example, one example of that I'm thinking is uh, Lesotho, for example, where we have a lot of um, 
traditional circumcision. And in that, uh, to, to get to men who have been traditional circumcised and, you know, um, uh, uh, incentivize or actually uh, promote their access of VMMC, uh, one uh, strategy that is particularly helpful is to have uh, other men who are traditional circumcised that have gone through circumcision to talk to them, even if they don't talk directly about their experience with, you know, traditional versus um, versus uh, BMMC, because there may be some cultural, you know, um, challenges there in terms of respect. Sometimes people don't talk about traditional circumcision openly. Uh, just giving the example, you know, just standing in front of their other peer as a person who, you know, has gone traditional circumcision and now is talking about BMMC is actually very powerful modeling uh, example. So again, you know, it depends, but yes, women are definitely and can definitely be very effective mobilizers. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the tools are posted on the AIDS3 uh, website. They're in the resource library uh, in the VMMC section of AIDS3 and also on the webinar page. So if you um, go back to the webinar page, you can also access links to all the tools that we're talking about today. Uh, I have another question uh, for Maria uh, from uh, a participant. Uh, and the question is, has the evaluation tool been pre-tested? Yes, yes, absolutely. We tested it in Malawi and we tested it in South Africa with our colleagues from H3 in Malawi and USC in South Africa. And, uh, you know, through that pre-testing, we modified uh, various questions. We also realized and came to the conclusion that it was not possible to come up with a numeric score, which is actually something we wanted to do at the beginning uh, of, the, of tool development, but it quickly became clear that that was not um, feasible. And, uh, and again, though, remember that wh while they have been tested, you will need to contextualize some questions to fit your, your local context. We also tested the, the shorter version and the longer version, right? Yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, another question was, uh, do you have a training curriculum for the mobilizers? So is there a specific curriculum for mobilizers? Or will you be moving in that direction? What do you mean? This is the training curriculum. Sorry, I'm not understanding the question. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? So we had a question about um, if uh, if the is the training specific to mobilizers or um, yeah yes well no it's definitely specifically designed for mobilizers and is based on experience with trainings in other in various countries so we've taken uh, you know the best. Of, the, of what we've seen in various curriculums and, in, you know, put it into this training. So um, we hope that it is, a, hope it is very useful. And again, in terms of how to use the training that we are sharing with you, you know, you can either take it as is and run with it and use it without making any changes. You can actually, it is better actually to contextualize some of the sessions, like Lee said, or you could just take some of the sessions and integrate into your current curriculum, or you could actually take the training we're providing and take some of the sessions of your current curriculum and adapt them. So there are many things you can do, uh, but what we are hoping that we're providing with this training is the minimum items that should be included in a training for community mobilizers working on VMMC demand creation. And it sounds like the tool uh, is very flexible in, in being able to fit it into your country context and, um, you know, and it, regarding with your local laws and pulling it into your local language and such um, with sort of a menu of options. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move uh, to another question. Um, it says, it looks like the tool focuses on the quality of demand creation efforts. Um, does it address how to evaluate the impact the efforts have had on VMMC uptake? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah, do you want to start, Liz? No, no, that's a really good question. And and yeah, the answer is no. It, it's not it's not evaluating the impact. So the way this tool came about is it, it, in countries where USAID was was finding it challenging to meet targets, they would ask uh, to have an assessment done to identify okay what's going on, what what are the challenges, what are the barriers, why aren't we you know getting where we want to be with our demand creation. So. It's really an assessment to determine what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what, what should we be doing better, and, and to make some, you know, course corrections, so to speak, you know, going forward. What can we improve upon? Um, it is not going to assess the impact, as, as you're asking. Yes, yes. And uh, just to add to that, I mean, uh, you know, yeah, it, assessing impact is very important. Um, I mean, just very roughly, you know, to assess your impact, you, the first thing you look, of course, is your numbers, right? What are your numbers? Are you reaching your targets? Um, but, and then, of course, you go back from there, what's happening, uh, you know, for reaching or reaching target, et cetera. But like Lee said, this tool is not assessing impact. It's actually more of an exploration of what it is that, you know, is happening on the ground on VMMC demand creation, what activities are being implemented, what activities are not being implemented, and what could be uh, added uh, to strengthen your demand creation efforts. So, um, and again, you know, the tool, the questions included in the tool uh, for, uh, allow for a conversation with uh, different key players in demand creation in the in VMMC to, to help you answer the question of, you know, what can be done to strengthen your demand creation efforts. Great. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, Liz. Um, I have another question, and this is from the uh, Aid Free Mozambique team. So uh, thanks for your participation. Uh, they would like to know who would be the person to conduct this assessment, the VMMC national coordinator, or who would conduct this assessment? That yeah, one for me. You want to take that one, or you? Want to? Sure, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead. Well, we actually, in in designing it, our thought was that a variety of we we wanted to design it in a way that a variety of people could do this assessment. So, for I think Maria explained that we did two versions of the tool. There's sort of the shorter version with parts one and two, and then if you add parts three and four, you get a more in-depth um, assessment. But our thinking was it could be, for example, a USAID, you know, the USAID point of contact for VMMC, or it could be the ministry VMMC coordinator. It, it could, it really could, anybody could really use the tool. That, that was sort of our thinking that, that wanted to get a, a snapshot of, of their demand creation efforts. Um, I think if you, for the more in-depth four-part version, it, it's probably better to have someone that really has expertise in demand creation and SDCC, whereas the parts one and two are, are um, more geared towards somebody who may not necessarily have the expertise but wants to get a, a quick snapshot of the program. Does that make sense? I don't yeah. know, Maria. Yeah. yeah, so just to add on to that, you know, in terms of specifically who could use the tool, that's what, you know, Liz answered. But in terms of practical terms, you know, how, who, how to use the tool, who should use it to assess the program? Well, for example, if you are doing an internal assessment, you could have the program director use the tool uh, to, to understand exactly what's happening on VMMC demand creation and, again, how to strengthen VMMC demand creation efforts. Um, you know, from the USAID or donor side, the USAID point of contact in the field um, in, in the USAID mission offices could actually use the tool to all, do an assessment of, you know, how of the implementing partner, the man creation efforts. And also, finally, the Ministry of Health, the VMMC point of contact there, could actually take the tool and go out and assess what's happening in VMMC, the man creation, in their, you know, geographic area of purview. So, you know, there could be various people using the tool, and again, with the goal of understanding what's happening on VMMC demand creation and how to strengthen VMMC demand creation efforts. Great. Thank you. 
Um, I have another question. What's the minimum qualification of a mobilizer? I think that that definitely varies by country. Some, I, I know in Mozambique, they want them to have a certain educational level, but I, that, that completely varies by, by country program. I don't know if um, Maria Tanke or Mayende want to comment, but that, that varies country by country. Yeah, and one thing to consider there is what, you know, your, your mobilizer, what is the audience, the, the, the key a potential BMMC clients that they'll be reaching or targeting. If the clients are, of course, more highly educated or at higher education level, then, of course, you want your mobilizer to have a higher level of education. If your clients have a lower level of education, then, again, you know, it, it may not be necessary to have a highly educated mobilizer. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, what uh, is the level of education for a mobilizer that is going through the training that we have shared today, it's, it's meant to be for any level of education. So we put it at a level so that it can encompass mobilizers with low level of education to high level of education. Uh, it's a very uh, hands-on, engaging training where people at various you know, educational levels and from various backgrounds can benefit and, and can learn from, from this training. Do we have any other questions? Oh, it looks like it looks like um, H Free Tech is having a bit of a challenge with the phone. So uh, let me read the next question. It says uh, it looks like the tool focuses on the quality of the demand creation efforts. Does it address how to buy? Oh, sorry, we already went through that. Apologies. Um, okay, the last one. What is the attrition rate for the mobilizers? What is the attrition rate? Yeah. Yeah, could you talk? Yeah, we're back on. I'm not sure what happened to our AT&T phone line, but it's back on. Um, yeah, we. the last question, thanks, Maria, was, you know, could yeah. talk a little bit about the attrition rates of, of I, mobilizing. Yeah, I think a lot of countries are struggling with that, um, where there's a high attrition rate, where they're, they're losing, you know, they'll have a mobilizer do, do all this effort, and then they lose them. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with how you're – compensating them and, and equipping them and treating them, basically. Um, so, you know, if, if, if they can't, I've seen where they, they leave because, you know, they said we're not getting paid on time or it's not worth my while, I'm having to pay my own transport or whatever it is, they're, they're not going to stay. So, um, and also just valuing them. Um, I had a conversation in one country with mobilizers where they said, you know, everybody was celebrating the 100,000th man, but they didn't even invite us to the celebration. So, you know, they don't value the role that we play. So I think it, you're going to have a high attrition rate if you don't really uh, invest in in these folks because they bring a lot to the table and, and they're really the backbone of the program. So it's worth, you know, supporting them and giving them the equipment they need. And yeah, what absolutely. Thank you, Liz. And what about um, you know with community mobilizers, you know, and V, you know, and VMMC, and you know, HIV positive men um, and boys. Uh, what we haven't really talked about um, that much, or around the ethical considerations of informed consent. Um, do you have any thoughts around training for mobilizers? and, you know, HIV testing um, and getting people into treatment, um, as well as the ethical considerations around informed consent? There's a whole section on informed consent in the training. Sorry, I wasn't sure what the question, what you're asking. So there is a whole section around informed consent. Oh, yeah, definitely on informed consent, yes.
Yes, no, just to add on to that very quickly, informed consent is very important, and the training clearly defines what it is. Uh, it uh, identifies, you know, the, the, that in different countries it's different age ranges, and to and that's where contextualization will come in. But uh, it emphasizes the the critical importance of informed consent. So, um, you know, take a look at the training. There is there is a very thorough section on on the training about that, and we hope that really per equips and prepares mobilizers to to understand what it is and also its importance. Great, thank you. Um, and someone was uh, asking about: Is it possible to share the curriculum for community mobilizers? I just wanted to remind everyone to, you know, if you access the tools, um, um, the curriculum and um, information is all included in the tool. Uh, and could you talk, uh, Maria and Liz, maybe a bit more broadly or bigger picture around what's the difference between demand creation versus awareness creation? Yeah, just very quickly before we go there, I just want to make sure all folks uh, re understand that you know the, all the tools we're making available, so you have access to everything on the link that was uh, on. Maybe we can put it up at some point, Erin. Uh, the link, the slide with the link. So go to that link, and you will have the full training with all of the materials, the PowerPoint presentation. You'll also get the um, the external, the, the, sorry, the, the assessment tool. So all of that is in there for you to just take on and run with it and improve your VMMC demand creation activities. Uh, so sorry about that plug. Um, so it, the question was, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Yeah, could you? Uh, and I just wanted to add on to that. And the slide deck and everything related to the curriculum is all included uh, on the web page and in the materials. So you should have, you know, everything you need, right. you know, around the guidance and the tool and the curriculum and all, you know, that. Um, and there's even parts of the tool that are called out for the local context and you know, good places where you can add in, um, you know, local law. Uh, specific information and things like that. So it's very comprehensive and it's all included in um, the right. tool and, and on the H3 website. Thanks, uh, Erin. And just, so just to be clear, when you download the curriculum, you're going to see two pieces. One is the facilitator's training manual, and that's accompanied by a slide deck. So you need both of those pieces. And then for the assessment tool, you'll see the four parts that Maria described, as well as a template to uh, for writing your report. And after the webinar, we'll send around the link uh, again and to the web page and everything because you can download all of these materials um, quite easily. Uh, so I think we have one time for one more question. Uh, so our last question uh, uh, is, could you talk a little bit about the difference between demand creation and awareness creation? Maria? <laughs> well, I, I I will give you a very simple example. You know, you uh, create demand. And uh, sorry, I'm going to be a little funny, but you create demand among men, and you raise awareness among women for VMMC. Sorry, I just had to, that that just really came to me. But again, awareness creation is really about understanding. You know, what is VMMC? What are the benefits? And one of the one of the groups with whom we do and we must do a lot of awareness creation is women. Studies in various countries show that uh, women's support for VMMC is very important, if not critical, in men accessing VMMC services. So, in some countries like in Tanzania, for example, I know there's a special effort to reach out to women and inform them about what is VMMC and what are the benefits for men and also for women that can come out from VMMC. Now, in terms of, you know, demand creation, that's more of, you know, linking people and trying to get them to access the service. We want them to come into our doors and get circumcised. So in terms of now the, the, the differences in terms of the information you provide, when you are raising awareness, you know, you may provide some more general information and background information when you're actually 
trying to create demand, you have to give more specific information, and demand creation also requires more follow-up. You know, it's not just a one-stop awareness creation where you provide information. It requires following up with the client to make sure that they have the information they need and that they have um, overcome barriers they may have so that they can access the service. So in that sense, demand creation is more intensive. It requires more follow-up. It may require more time, more resources, even in terms of providing transportation, for example, whereas awareness raising is really, you know, disseminating information, informing people about the benefits, and uh, leaving it at that. Great. Thanks. So most, I'm, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Liz. I was just going to say, in, in, in really, in most countries, we're past the point of, of awareness raising. People are aware of it. We, we're really working on creating the demand and addressing those barriers and facilitators to, to get men into services, which requires different, more interpersonal communication rather than the channels you might use to just raise awareness. Well, thank you both very much for your uh, comprehensive presentations and this rich discussion um, around demand creation and this excellent tool. Um, I think I'll hand it over to Lee now to wrap things up. Uh, but thank you so much for all of your participation and questions. Uh, Lee? Thank you, guys. Uh, before we wrap up today, I'd like to again thank the speakers for sharing their time and expertise today. And thank you to all of the participants for attending and for the rich discussion. In a few days, you will be receiving an email with a link to today's webinar recording. Before we sign off, I'd like to encourage all of you to take a moment to fill out the poll questions that have just appeared on your screen as the feedback is always helpful for us to improve our future webinars. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.